Hey, welcome everybody. Wanted to be sure I was on the screen. My name is Rachel Donadio and I'm hosting this web seminar today with the SNF Agora Institute, which is an academic center and public forum at Johns Hopkins University dedicated to improving and expanding civic engagement and informed inclusive dialogue as the cornerstone of global democracy, no less. We're going to be starting with a panel discussion that will last for about 45 minutes, and then we will take questions from the audience. So you are welcome to submit your questions at any time during the program using the Q&A function, and I will choose which questions to pose to the panelists. And the chat function is turned off for comments, but it's on for the panelists. And a recording of this evening's conversation or today's, this afternoon's conversation, depending on your time zone, will be available on SNF Agora's website and on our YouTube channel as well. I am a journalist based in Paris and a contributing writer for The Atlantic. And I am also a former Rome bureau chief of the New York Times. And in that capacity, I covered the Vatican. So I have been thinking about the intersection of religion and politics for quite some time. And this conference is going to look at some of the particularities of the situations in France and in the United States. Few countries have such intertwined and interconnected histories when it comes to matters of religious liberty. France's 1789 Declaration of the Rights of Man was influenced by Thomas Jefferson's Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom, which ended state funding for organized religion in Virginia in 1786. And then Jefferson was later US ambassador to France during the French Revolution and advised the Marquis de Lafayette in drafting the Declaration of the Rights of Man. But in recent years, France and the US have become very different sides of the coin, which has been fascinating for me to watch as an American living in France. Emmanuel Macron's government recently passed sweeping legislation to shore up Republican values, including making it harder for parents to send their kids to homeschool them. And this is out of concern that religious minorities might take their kids out of public schools, which are seen as these crucibles where citizens are formed. But in the US, on the other hand, we have courts and conservative advocates who wanna make it easier to homeschool out of concern that public schools are too secular and recent court rulings have opened the door for more public funding of religious education. And COVID public school closures have exacerbated that. That's something we'll address in the second panel about the United States, but for now, we're gonna dive straight in to France. And for France, we have a terrific panel. I'm welcome, I'm very excited to, to welcome everybody. We have um, Mayanti Fernando, who is an Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of, of uh, California, Santa Cruz, and is the author of The Republic Unsettled, Muslim French and the Contradictions of Secularism. We have Mathilde Philippe Gay, who is a Professor of Law at the University of Lyon and director of its Center for Constitutional Law. And her work focuses on the application of the constitutional principle of laicite, like laicite in practice. Joan Scott is Professor Emerita in the so School of Social Science at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, and is the author of many books on French history and feminist theory. Patrick Veil is a senior research fellow at France's National Research Center at the University of Paris 1 Pantheon Sorbonne, and a visiting professor at Yale Law School. And his most recent book is about de la laïcité en France, about laïcité in France. Now, we're expected also to be joined by Hakim El Karoui, who is a business consultant and author of many studies about Islam in France, including a French Islam is possible. So I hope he will pop in at any time from Paris. But first of all, I wanna just jump in by asking all of you, laïcité is, a giant issue in France, a founding principle, but what is it? How can we define it? And I would like to ask all of you to give me and give our, our audience a short definition of how, of what laïcité is. And I guess we could go in alphabetical order and start with Mayanti. Take it away. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you for the invitation to join all of you. And I'm really, I'm really happy to be in conversation with all of you. Um, some of you who I've known for years and others who I'm meeting for the first time. So thank you. Um, so I'll jump right in. I think, and I think you wanted us to keep it to two minutes, so I will try. But um, from, I think laicite, I mean, it's, it's hard to give a definition, but I would say, I think it's, it's conventionally understood as the separation of religion and politics, religion and the state. 
um, and state neutrality toward religion. And I would define it in slightly diff different terms. Uh, I think laicite is actually less the separation of religion and politics and more the regulation of religious life by the state. Um, and that means intervening into religious life. Uh, it means defining what counts as religion, what is good religion, what is bad religion, what is religion, what is fundamentalism, you know, so-called fundamentalism, what is religion, what is culture. So in order to manage religion, you, the state first has to define what it is. Um, and so there's a kind of logical impossibility or logical tension that is fundamental to laicite, which is that the state is constantly in the business of defining what religion is in order to manage it properly, in order to define its limits. Um, and that the form that laicite takes, I think, I, I think of laicite as a practice more than a principle in a lot of ways. And that the form that laicite, laicite takes is of, of course historically specific and depends on historical context and political regimes. And so the, the uh, laicite is intervention, right? Intervention into religious life can be more or less punitive depending on historical context and political regime and what, you know, what religious life is being regulated. And so I think we're in a moment right now where the regulation of religious life in particular Muslim life by the state is in a particularly punitive moment but it has not always been like this. It has not always been like this toward all religions. Um, and so, so yeah, that's how, I mean, I think it's less a, I don't think it's possible to define it in any, any sort of concrete terms other than as the, as the regulation of religious life by the state. Mathilde, you're next. Uh, yes, um, I think this uh, presentation was very interesting. Uh, uh, but first, I want to thank you all for the organization of this uh, event. And I, will, I must say that I will speak as a lawyer and only as a lawyer. Uh, I'm sure that each of us uh, can give a very good definition of secularism, of laicity. And uh, I think that Patrick Veil uh, can give a very good uh, definition after me. But I would like to say um, something very important uh, for the discussion. Um, Firstly, there is a difference between the philosophical definition and the legal definition. And it's very important to understand that about laicity. For instance, if I take the example of the Burkini, I think you remember the Burkini ban from some French beaches uh, by some Mayas. Uh, as you know, about 20 Mayas decided uh, to ban Burkini. Uh, from the beaches in uh, 2016 and uh, to make uh, such a ban. But lawyers like me had no doubt that the Supreme Administrative Court, the Conseil d'État, would overturn this ban in the name of freedom of religious expression. And that is indeed what it did. So politically, some Mayas tried to ban religious signs, but legally, they had no right to do so. Laïcité do not prohibit religious signs and closing on the French beaches. So there is no ban on the Burkini as such in France. Uh, secondly, it is necessary to understand that there is a philosophical current of laïcité which is strong in France, uh, which would like a neutrality of the public space. But that doesn't mean that everybody in France supports this neutrality. It is one of the important political tendencies, but there are others on the question. It doesn't mean either that the law prohibits religion in the public sphere. On the contrary, the law protects, protects this religious expression in the public space. So the exceptions are real, but they are few. Uh, even if it's important, of course, to speak about these exceptions, to analyze them, one should not think or let's think that is the rule in France. So laïcité do not prohibit religious uh, philosophical or political signs and closing in the public space. Uh, the exceptions are few, like being naked, even if you think that God created you naked and that your philosophical commission imposed you to never put clothes as a British applicant tried uh, to defend it before the court. Um, you don't be naked, you won't be uh, full covered. And finally, those exceptions, uh, they were inspired for the oldest by the Catholic religion, for the most recent one were inspired by Islam, of course, and the future will maybe uh, be inspired by the evangelicals, but in law, they apply to all the convictions. 
So it is very necessary to uh, say it and to uh, remember that uh, there is no legal treatment difference uh, there is no difference in the legal treatment uh, between religions, except in some part of the territory, where in Alsace-Moselle you will have a, a different treatment between Catholic, Jewish, Lutheran. In Mayotte, Islam have a status very special. Uh, in Guyane, this is Catholic. So uh, we really uh, must be very clear about the philosophical uh, definition of uh, laicity, the legal one, and the political meaning of it. So maybe Patrick will uh, complete, Patrick Veil will complete uh, this definition. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Mathilde. I think now that Hakim has joined, we were going in alphabetical order. So I will jump to, to Hakim al Karawi, who's joining us from Paris and ask you if you could give us a brief definition of, of laïcité, Hakim. We can't hear you. Could you hear me? We hear you. The line isn't great, but go ahead and we'll try. No, I think we're having some technical difficulties. We can't hear you. So maybe you could try joining again with a with a better line, Hakim. Thank you. Um, why don't we go next to who's next in alphabetical order to Joan Scott. Tell us what you how you would define laïcité. Thanks. I just also want to thank you, Rachel, for um, inviting us for this conversation. So I think um, although I would agree with Mathilde that the legal and philosophical definitions of uh, laïcité uh, differ, I would say both are open to interpretation, both are political, uh, uh, both depend on how the, this, these sort of open philosophical principles like liberty, equality, fraternity are being interpreted and put into practice. So in some general way, the principles of laïcité as, as my auntie described them, their freedom of individual conscience, equality and non-discrimination for believers of whatever faith and even for those who have no uh, beliefs, separation of religion and politics and the neutrality of the state in relation to religion and the management of all of this by the state, uh, the regulation of religion, the definition of what counts as an acceptable or not religion by the state. And I think the exact, and, and so that means that the political context is the defining issue for what counts as laïcité. You can't, I'm a historian, without the history of, of its uses and its implementations and its, def, and its contextual definitions, you don't get an understanding of laïcité. My example would be the difference between the law of 1905 and the uh, 2003 uh, uh, report issued by uh, uh, François Baron which was called la nouvelle laïcité, the new laïcité. The, the, roughly the distinction is in 1905, the issue is the neutrality of the state in relation to religion and religious practice. In 2003, four, it's, it's the neutrality of citizens in public space. So in 1905, the issue was not about regulating what one wore or how one behaved in public space, it was how representatives of the state uh, were required to be neutral. You could not appear, you could not work in the post office or be a policeman or a mayor and indicate any religious affiliation because the neutrality of the state was what mattered. Now, what is being regulated is the um, display of religious identification and religious affiliation in public space. So women wearing headscarves, um, are, are, uh, or women wearing the voile intégrale, the niqab, are uh, punished for um, appearing covered in, in, in public space. Mothers can't go with their mothers, veiled mothers cannot accompany their children on, um, on um, school trips and school visits and so on and so forth. So the, the really crucial distinction, I think, um, and one that has everything to do with politics and everything to do with the increased numbers and problems presented to the French state by the, the numbers of Muslims in um, 
French uh, society is the, the difference between what, what's getting regulated. In one case, state neutrality. In the second case, uh, public, the public space itself is now required to be, to be neutral. So again, um, that means the context is everything and the political climate is everything. Uh, and how that word laicite gets interpreted and deployed depends on who's using it and for what ends. Thanks, Joan. I think we have Hakim back. So we'll try one more time before we go to Patrick. I'm really sorry for the little technically. Um, so uh, to, to, to try to understand ICT to, um, to foreign people and even, you know, for to French people, I think we, we need to admit that there are at least four not definitions of laïcité, but using of laïcité. Uh, the first one, Mathilde Philippe Gay um, talked a lot about this, is a, is a legal one. Laïcité is very simple. It's a separation between the church and the state and the non-recognition by the states of any churches. So it's a, it's a law, 1905. The word laïcité was not in the law, but it helps the different religions in France uh, of course, the Catholic one, but also uh, all, all the others to be present and, and theoretically not to have any issues with the state. Second, laïcité is also, um, we have to go, to go back to, to French history. Uh, laïcité is uh, the inheritance of the battle between the state and the church. Going back to the to the Middle Ages, the Middle Ages, the battle between the king and the pope, and for many people, laïcité is a way for the state to counter the ambition of the church. Historically speaking, of course, this involves religious wars between Catholics and Protestants. Now it involves Islam. So the second definition of laïcité involves the organization of power between the state, the government, and the churches. But there is also a third definition of laïcité, which is tied to the enlightenment. Laïcité is another word for a lot of people of atheism, which is seen as being free from religious control and thinking. And last but not least, laïcité, and specifically for the far right, but not only for the far right, is a word to be Islamophobic with um, a proper uh, distinction and a proper concept. So it's normal if you don't understand what laïcité means, because the word, the concept is used with at least four several meanings. And the people who, who use uh, laïcité, uh, depending on this meaning, I mean, using the different meaning, of course, they are talking from a certain point of view. Um, the far right is, is, is using laïcité to say Islamophobia. Um, a part of the left is using laïcité to say we need to promote atheism and specifically against Islam. Um, the right, a part of the right is using, using laïcité to remind the long battle between the Pope and the state and a part of the, of the left too. And from a legal perspective and, and a lot of religious people, they are using laïcité from the legal definition. So we don't understand what laïcité means because it is used with so many different meanings. Thank you. And finally, Patrick Veil, tell us what you believe laïcité means. So the fact that we debate one, two, three, four meanings show the low status of law in my country, in France. Because in the United States, when people would discuss the status of religion, no one would contest that the main frame belongs to two provision of the, first of the First Amendment. In France, we debate the status of law, but in fact, laïcité uh, has, uh, once the law has been passed, all the philosophical, the, the, it's an issue of interpretation. I totally agree with John Scott, but it is a legal regime of 
faith. It's an illegal regime. And why, where I agree with my, my auntie, it is that it's a legal regime, and with John, is that it's a legal regime what came in an historical context where the church was dominating the French state, and so it's an affirmation of the French sovereignty on, of its citizen, including on religious affairs. So it's an organization by the sovereign people of France of the legal regime of religion. And I would like to add two things, one thing that has to, to what you all say. First of all, it's the affirmation of freedoms, free, freedom of conscience, freedom of expression of your face if you have one, and it's an affirmation of neutrality of state by separation, by separating religion and the state. But what has been missing in the reasoning, and that is a, a main, uh, I would say, bonus of my most recent book, is that comparing these liberties to another liberty, like for example, freedom of property. One of the writer of the 1905 law say, if you just affirm freedom of free uh, right of property without penalizing the violation of property, it's just nothing affirming uh, uh, right of property. So within the law of 1905, there are some section, which is a criminal law that punished any pressure on your freedom to believe or not to believe, and any violation of the power of, the power of uh, religion to organize their faith, or of religious authority to intervene on pressuring a, a, a citizen uh, or, or, or civil servant in civil and public affairs. And this provision has been used massively when the Pope asked the Catholic to reject the law, to fight against the law by any means between 1906 and 1914, and hundreds of cases went to the court, uh, uh, bishops, cardinals were condemned, and this history has been forgotten. And I have revived that story because these provisions are useful in the context where the government was trying to change the law when everything was already set in the law of 1905. One thing so, I want to add, one thing I want to add because it's what John writes in her book is very important, is that in fact, when they wrote the law, they borrow from the US. The first amendment was very influential in the writing of the first two articles of 1905. But the political historical context is so different. In the United States, the first amendment was created in reaction of a, of a of the Anglican state where you have an official religion run by the government. And so in the triangle between the individual, the, the religion and the group and the state, the state, the religious group appears as the protector of the individual against any intrusion of the state. In France, it's the opposite. The state appears as the protector of the individual against an intrusion of the religion. So even if our laws have a common, a common ground, which is non-establishment, when there is tension, we react in the opposite way. We see that there are many different interpretations of what laicite is. The 1905 law to which you refer is the one passed in France that officially separated church and state, that kind of pushed the Catholic church out of a certain position of sovereignty that it had previously occupied in France. But today, as Hakim and Mayanthi and everyone else also agrees, this is a cultural battle in a way. It's like a culture war. Like, how do we define this? And what? And 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 today, when people talk about laicite in France, I think it's less about the finer points of the 1905 law, although. Mathilde's job is to help apply laicite in practical circumstances, but it becomes a debate about national identity. Who are we as French? What do we believe in? What does it mean to be French? In a way that other European countries don't, you know, they're not tangled up in the same kind of debates. This is something that seems particularly unique to France. And I wonder if we could talk a little bit just about the broader implications here in particular, Patrick and, and Joan Scott have, have disagreed ideologically over certain concepts about, you know, whether 
this debate about laicite ultimately intersects with debates about about race or not, or you know, religion and and race connecting. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about you know what how laicite intersects with these debates about about national identity. Mathilde, you've raised your hand, so you go next. Thank you. I think that in your DNA, there is the conflict. <laughs> uh, we are a country of conflict in general and of religious conflict in particular. And I think we are afraid of those conflicts. Uh, for a very long time, there was a political refusal to think in terms of identity. Uh, the constitution forbids distinguish according to race, a provision adopted um, uh, before, sorry, before, uh, after, sorry, uh, the Second World War uh, because of uh, the French colonies and in remembrance of what the Jews uh, suffered during uh, the Second World War. So uh, in 1958, the values of the French Republic were perceived as universal, attractive. I think this is one of the reasons along with the context of decolonization for the real refusal to talk about identity then. Since the 90s, I think that the political perception of these French values and the conditions of their invocation have changed. It is rather the concept of national identity, uh, which is then put forward by some as a solution to the crisis of values which would be crossed because of three factors. On the one hand, the European construction, the globalization uh, are presented as a threat from outside. Uh, it would cause a kind of cultural standardization uh, that would render nation states powerless to produce meaning, uh, justice, social progress. On the other hand, the fear of the communitarism that is real in France, likely to dilute all the values from within, provokes questions about the condition of their survival in the face of particular values resulting from cultural diversity, religious diversity. So um, uh, I think that the, now the Islamist terrorism uh, provoking once again withdrawal debates, notably on the place of the Muslim religion in the Republic, but that's like a uh, it would be synthetic uh, synthesis of external and internal traits that uh, this fear uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, revealing. So I think that uh, that explains why this uh, particular concept of national identity is such mobilized uh, until uh, the, the, the presidential uh, campaign is uh, really uh, uh, showing us uh, that. Yes, we have an election campaign in France. When you say communitarism, that is a term that I guess we would translate as, in some ways, identity politics or religious yes. or ethnic groups. Sorry, yes. Emphasizing their identity in that way, mm. which is always in France seen as somehow a threat to national unity. Mayanthi, you raised your hand. I'm going to actually cede my place to Joan and then I'll go. She raised her hand first. But since, since you asked about, about race, Rachel, um, I guess I would say that a, a lot of the argument about laicite and the unacceptability of um, Muslim practices for French national identity is a way of displacing the question or, or religifying the question of race. Because what we're talking about is a population of former colonial subjects who, who now live in, for the most part, um, discriminated against conditions in, in France. Um, and if the, but, but race has to be denied as the, the reason for their uh, inferior treatment, uh, for, their, uh, for the position that they occupy both economically and socially as, as uh, subordinate or dominated or inferior groups. And so laicite becomes the excuse for what I think of as a, as, a, as a racialized set of practices that have to do with the fact that these are uh, brown people, they are former colonial subjects, they are, um, they are not French in the way in which assimilation to French culture and values, but also to French racial understandings of what it means to be French in racialized ways actually operate. So laicite cannot be separated 
from the ways in which the racial identities of these populations are also at stake. Patrick, you've written about citizenship and the idea of French citizenship, and you've raised my, your hand. What do, what do you make? Uh, I'm sorry, Mayanthi, you were going to- was next. Yeah, sorry. Can I um, just say, I, I want to agree with Joan, except to tweak, uh, to tweak slightly and to say that the, the, the problem the Muslim has posed has always been a problem of race and religion. And the figure of the Muslim has always been both a racialized figure and a religious figure. And if you look at, you know, kind of the colonial regime in Algeria, even the terminology, right? Um, Muslim was Arab, was indigène. Les musulmans, les arabes et les indigènes, même chose, in the law itself, right? And so I just think it's worth, I mean, I, yes, I think there, I think Joan is absolutely right that, that laïcité is, is a cover to, um, to talk about and regulate a highly racialized population, but, um, but, the, but Muslims have always been both race and religion. And, and I also agree with Mathilde that this is also about a kind of post-imperial French condition and a post- um, kind of post-Europeanization, uh, you know, there's there's been a kind of neoliberal restructuring of France, and and there's a certain fragilization of republican values and of of the republic itself, right? And and you know, I mean, there's a kind of lack of a, a social safety net that there's been in the past. The welfare state is crumbling. These the the, the republic, as many French knew it, is really no longer. Um, and I think in some ways, you know, the most recent, the sort of scandal about the nuclear subs and Macron's, uh, the, the kind of, the, the, the sort of, um, I don't know what the word is, but the, the distress that, that, you know, Biden had basically, that French, the, that France was just no longer as important to NATO, to uh, kind of Western regime, um, signals, I think, this kind of post-imperial condition that then gets, you um, Muslims in some ways become the, the way in which Republican authority can reassert itself on the, on the bodies of black and brown people. And there's a really interesting way in which, you know, a lot of social science liter literature has, has blamed precarity for the emergence of an identitarian Islam and of Islamic communitarism, Islamic sort of tribalism. And I think one can make the same argument about the majority of the French as well, that there's a way in which um, precarity and social precarity produces a certain kind of attachment to an identitarian French national identity and l'identité républicaine, l'identité française. Patrick and then Hakim. Yeah, let me add things to what you say. First of all, uh, there is a lot of ignorance, also legal ignorance, uh, in, in, the, in the country about the status of Islam and Muslims. First of all, Islam was part of the 1905 law at the origin because the, the place of Algeria in, in the law was discussed and the parliament decided to apply laicite to Algeria with a transitional period. The government kept the transitional period until the independence, but the parliament didn't see Islam or being a Muslim as a, as, a, as a problem of being part of the law. And that is very important because even the French president mentioned that, that Islam was not part of 1905 law in an official statement at the beginning of his term. The second thing, yeah, yes, John? Just, I'm sorry, just a question. Um, didn't Algeria have personal status law that put the whole question of religion and the family? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The this, that's exactly my second point. Okay. Sorry. It is that the law, the organization of religion is formally independent of your status because, for example, the First Amendment applies to all foreigners in the US. It doesn't apply only to American citizens. So you, they, they wanted to have a regime of religion that was independent of every things, including the personal status you just mentioned. So, and for example, when today, some people say laicite is equality between men and women. Bullshit, 1905, there was no equality of, 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 between men and women. Laicite requests the respect of the law of the Republic. The law of the Republic have changed over a century 
and they have to, religious authority have to respect the law of the Republic of today as they had to respect the law of 1905 when it was passed. That's, so, the, so that's the second remark I would like to make. And, the, and to respond to your question, Raksha, I, for the Muslim who are citizen, the fact that they are assigned to an ethnical religious, as, as, as uh, my, my auntie mentioned, the mixture of this identity, doesn't permit them to be fully enjoying the freedom of their freedom affirmed by laicity. Because I ask the question, you admit that laicity is the right not to believe. But if you have been raised in religion and you want to, to break with your faith, you need to find a place where you feel at home. And if you don't feel at home in the Republic, you cannot enjoy your a freedom of conscience or freedom of your, of your rights to believe or not to believe. If you are not part of the, of the history, you are taught at school about colonization, slavery, decolonization, abolition, etc., that will give you an identity of citizen. And when the Muslim kids enter school, what did they do? They started teaching them their language of country of origin as to try to repatriate them first. And then they included religion in the curriculum instead of teaching colonial history, which, would, which, would, which was the political dimension of their identity that has been completely, I would say, uh, dismissed or, or not taught uh, until very recently. This is really one of the great tensions and contradictions in France, the, the, the universalist ideal, universalism is a kind of emancipatory concept that we should all leave part of our individual identities behind to join a collective versus the idea of kind of identifying ourselves or, 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 or putting first our, our kind of individual ethnic and, and religious identities. This is something that strikes me very much living in France is a great kind of difference between France and, and, and the United States in some ways. I wanted to get to, I know Joan's raising her hand, but I want, I, I want to get to- Just directly, just a quick directly thing. I think Patrick- Okay, and then we'll I, get to- I just think Patrick is right that if the teaching of colonial history had taken a different form, the question of identity politics as a kind of, of um, essentialized uh, meaning of one's life would not exist. So the problem is partly, in, in what was taken to be a long time denial of the history of colonialism, um, which gave the kids who were uh, embracing uh, an, uh, a Muslim identity, uh, no way of understanding where that had come from. I think that's a tremendously important point. Thank you. Hakim, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, um, because I think the situation is far more complex than uh, well, what I'm hearing. Um, first, laicity for the Muslim is, is really a way to be free, to be free from the, the alt-right and the far right, uh, because Muslims have the right to perform their religion, and th there is freedom of faith in France. Second, laicity is a way to protect the Muslims from the Islamists, and we don't have to deny the fact that in France, we have a problem with Islamist ideology, with terrorism in the name of Islam, and laicity for a lot of Muslims. It's a very promising concept, which prevents them from being oppressed by Islamist people who say to them, you are Muslim, you have to obey our rule. No, there is the Republican rule and we do what we want, what we want. Uh, third, we have to avoid the shortcut. Uh, considering uh, the French situation, considering the, the, the Muslims uh, with the same glasses as we consider the Afro-American issue in the US. It's not at all the same situation. First, there is no uh, Muslim, it's not a race. You have Muslims from North Africa, from Turkey, from Sub-Saharan Africa. From, from Asia, you have a lot of converted people. It's not a racial issue. Maybe for you, uh, you, you can interpret the situation with a racial point of view. It's not at all the case in France. Second, 
For a vast majority of Muslims, the situation is very, very good. And they are part of the French society. And they are inventing a new way of being Muslims. They are considering their, uh, the traditions of the culture of the countries of origin. They are mixing it with, with the French culture and with their modernity. And they are inventing a new way of being Muslim in the world. So uh, we have really, it's a complex issue. Um, it's not black and white. Uh, it's, our, it's, it's a gray, gray, gray issues and a lot of gray nuances, I don't know the world. Um, so let's try to accept this complexity. And for the sake of the French Muslims, um, let's help us to build new institutions because we need new institutions. We need local funding. There are a lot of money coming from French Muslims who are good practitioners, good believers, good believers, good believers, and who give a lot of money uh, to build mosques. The issue we have is that we need money to build a French, I mean, Western, a liberal interpretation of uh, the Islamic texts. Uh, this is, from my point of view, the most challenging, uh, the, the most important challenge uh, French Muslims have to face. My auntie. Yeah, Hakim, can I just ask, can I ask Hakim a question with regard to this? Um, could you just explain why this, so I, I agree with you that there is a kind of organic French Islam that has been actually emerging for a very long time. Um, and I write about this. And what strikes me is that the, the people who are actually producing like the sort of organic intellectuals and organic leaders who've been born and raised in France, who you know, attended French schools, who, um, who really are uh, inventing or reconfiguring Islam into a kind of, uh, you know, sort of French Islam are not the people that the government is listening to. And I guess I'm curious about why you think that the, that the emergence of a French Islam must come from state institutions and must be government sort of uh, because because that's really been yeah. the mode in which France has, I, has tried I'm, to I'm, produce this French Islam, right? I'm totally opposed to the idea that the government must produce French Islam. Uh, for five years, I've been, I, I'm still an activist of French Islam. What is French Islam? First, it's institutions. And institutions is funding. We need French money to build French Islam. And we need to avoid the intrusion of the French government and the intrusion of foreign governments. Foreign governments being Algerian government, Moroccan government, and Turkish government. This is very important. Second, French Islam is, it's a reality. It's a, it's a reality of the, mass, the vast majority of the French Muslims. They are, they believe, they practice, they pray with not any issue. But for political reasons, coming from the far right, coming from the far left, coming from the government, coming from foreign governments, there are a lot of interference. The stake of the French Muslims are, is in the hand of the French Muslims. And this is also the issue we have. We need them. We need the French Muslims to engage themselves, to tackle the issue of Islamism, to tackle the issue of foreign interferences, to tackle the issues of intellectual work on the, 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 I mean, the very text of Islam. We need we import interpretation of Islam coming from North Africa with the influence of Salafi Islam, with the influence of the Muslim Brotherhood. And we have activists of Islam. It's one team and in front of them, there is no one. There is people who are good practitioners, but who, who don't want to deal with Islam as a political issue. So the debate is not, I mean, it's not conformed to the reality. And you know, um, it's very challenging to mobilize the Muslims. And uh, the far right would not be at the level it is if the French Muslims were more mobilized. So, 
we need, and probably because first, they are very divided, very, very divided. And second, they are suffering from a lack of political sense. It's their interest to be mobilized. It's their interest to be in, on the streets, to be against the terrorist attacks on, in the name of Islam. So I'm quite optimistic. I think it's possible. It takes time. It takes time because of all the interferences. But at the end of the day, the destiny of the Muslims are in their hands. I wanted to go to Joan. This is an important point where I think a lot of our audience might might or might not know that a lot of foreign funding for mosques in France comes from overseas. And in recent months, there's been new legislation passed by the government of Macron to make it more difficult for uh, foreign um, governments and, and countries to fund mosques in France. So French Islam is very much connected to diaspora communities. Joan, you wanted to say. Well, yeah, I just think that that the, the thing that Hakim doesn't factor into his um, analysis is what I would call the question of race or racism. That is the, discrimina the discrimination in the job markets, in schools, in housing, that um, Muslims as a, as a group, not every Muslim, obviously, not every Arab or Maghrebian or African experiences, but as groups, these are the disadvantaged, discriminated, discriminated against populations, and they're discriminated against on the basis of their religion and their race. And so unless you take that factor into account, um, imagining unifying of um, something called a Muslim community in favor of something called a French Islam, I just find it impossible to, um, to imagine because un until those issues of discrimination are addressed, the sense of not being part of France uh, is, is you, you talk to, to, to young students um, in, in France, in schools, young um, Muslim or Arab students, and, and they'll tell you that they don't feel like they're French, um, that they don't feel, that, or if they're French, they're not fully French. I, I think my auntie has actually written about this. So how do you um, take those economic, those material issues into consideration when you imagine the kind of future that Hakim is, is imagining? Thank you. I want to um, get to Mathilde for just one second, and then I want to talk about this all day, but our time is running out. I want Mathilde to respond, and then we have room for a couple of questions that audience members have written in in the Q&A. So Mathilde, go ahead. Yeah, just five minutes. I'm, I'm a lot, for professional reason, I'm a lot in the mosques and I'm a lot uh, in the association, Muslim associations. Uh, so I can testify that uh, Akim is right. I really uh, don't hear a lot uh, about discrimination. I hear a lot about Islam, the way of constructing something uh, that they are still constructing, I can testify to. Uh, so it's very um, difficult to, to agree with you, Duan, because we can hear there are some discrimination, it's true, but I don't think it's the main uh, problem that we can hear uh, from the Muslims. We are speaking about the Muslims, so I see a lot of Muslims every day, and the first things that they are uh, speaking about, it's not the discrimination. It's about constructing something about their religion in France, and they are very inventive, really. And I, I just want to say one thing. I'm teaching to, um, to imams, and uh, you know, the day of the Charlie Hebdo attack, I can tell you that I didn't want to go uh, to teach them because um, I was uh, upset uh, uh, by the attacks. And so I decided to go uh, to, the, um, to, to school. But when I arrived at the university, there were nobody on the classroom. And I said, why are, are they uh, not there? And uh, 10 minutes later, they all come back. And in fact, they were all at the, uh, the crowd which uh, spawned, um, came uh, to manifest their um, opposition to what happened. So I want to tell you that they were all came uh, without uh, speaking them about me. They all went to testify that they wanted freedom of speech and that they were against the attacks. So they didn't go to the media to speak about it. It's just the imams of my town, but they were all there. 
So uh, it's not what I'm reading. When I read uh, in the US or abroad uh, the situation, I don't, um, I don't uh, find what I feel every day in the Muslim associations or in the Muslim mosque. So, um, it's clear that there that there's a kind of interconnection between these issues of of national identity, religious practice, sure. ethnic. Yeah, there's a lot of things intersecting in in France right now, especially with regards to I would say national identity meets meets national security, and there are many many issues to to that are tangled up that to, to disentangle. We have time for a couple questions. If you are in the audience and you want to write a question into the Q and A, do that. Now, quickly, I will ask, um, we have one audience question, which I think is important to address, which is what does laicite look like in educational spaces and what are its implications for the next generation, particularly as France moves towards a less homogeneous community? And I think that's a really important question too. Like what, what is the future of this current model? Who wants to start? Um, maybe a word? I don't know. Sure. Okay. I don't. Patrick had, yeah. his, we, had, we, Patrick had his hand up. Oh. Right from the beginning. Yes, Patrick, but Akim, Akim, go ahead. Go ahead, Akim. No, no, just, just very quick. Um, we have surveys about uh, laicity, and the ways different generations consider it. The young people are far more liberal than the rest of the population, and most of them are considering laicity as a constraint. And as a new way to, to, to say we are against uh, Islam. So they are much more liberal than the rest of the, the, the society. And it will probably um, have impact for, for the future. And it is still has impact with the young professors. Um, they are not backing the ways, for example, Mr. Blanker, the Minister of Education, is seeing laicity. And so for the, the minister, it's quite complex because he's not uh, on the ground. Uh, he's not followed on the ground. Um, but I mean, for, for my, from my point of view, the subject is not laicity. The subject is Islam. So uh, let's tackle the Islam issue. And, um, and laicity must be what, is, what it is, uh, legally speaking, uh, the separation between uh, the, the government and the church and the non-recognition. I think that's an important distinction. You're referring to polls that have shown that younger people believe in a kind of more soft interpretation of laicite. They don't see what's wrong with wearing religious symbols in, in schools, which of course were religious, ostentatious religious symbols were banned from French primary and secondary schools in, in, in 2004. And younger people think like, what's the problem with this? Why, why have this? Patrick, you were gonna say something. Yes, I was asked to give, deliver the final lecture in a training on laicity of the people in charge of training the teachers within the whole French system in the summer of 2019. And they all told me that they, don't, they didn't have the material to train the professor, the teachers. And everybody, every teacher was left doing their own teaching on a topic that everybody considered as so important for French identity they didn't have the material. And when, after the assassination of Samuel Paty, the Minister of Education announced two hours of, of, of teaching after the end of the uh, fall vacation, the fall break, and he canceled it. And he canceled it, and I knew why, because he was unable to furnish the teachers any uh, books or any material to organize a teaching that was uh, uh, possible for the kids. It's why I wrote my book. It is because I know how much the teachers are missing the, the possibility, uh, are ignorant because they have not been trained to teach laicite. So my interpretation of the polls is that I praise the kids to be able to respond to a few questions. So much the teacher were unable to train them really in the law and the history of laicite because they didn't have the material to do it. Mayanthi. Thanks, yeah, I'll just speak from my experience um, as a language assistant in a, in a lycée, in a high school in La Courneuve, which is a sort of um, uh, 
minor, it's a minoritized and pretty marginalized uh, northern suburb of Paris. And I think I want to just go back to a point that Joan and, and I think in some ways Patrick also made um, just about I, you know, I, I understand that this is a conversation about laicite, but the problem I think for the next generation and for future generations is really about a continued regime of, of marginalization and discrimination of black and brown people in France. And, um, and I think if you look at, you know, I mean, there are all kinds, there's, there's, I don't think that there's any point in figuring out how to teach laicite properly or do laicite properly if this population is continually discriminated against in jobs and education in, in there's no there's very little social mobility. And I will say just from my experience teaching there, um, which is very different from Mathilde's uh, experience with these imams, the problem really was discrimination. And the kids that I taught had very little investment in the school because the, the society had very little investment in them. And they knew that, you know, even with a back, they, their future was pretty bleak because they lived in a particular zip code and they lived in housing projects and they lived in spaces uh, and were part of a population that is simply not equal to the rest of the majoritarian white society. And so I think un until that is dealt with in a really structural way, laicite is, is a, this whole conversation about laicite in some ways is, is a distraction. Laicite is never entirely about laicite. I think that that is one conclusion that we could probably all agree on, no matter what our perspective is on this. This has been a hugely fruitful conversation, and I wish we could continue it much longer, but we have to take a short break before the US panel. I really am grateful to Hakim Al-Karoui, Mayanti Fernando, Mathilde Philippe Gay, Joan Scott, and Patrick Veil for joining us on the France panel. 